Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Martin Burger. Uh, he will speak today about uh, regularization methods, inverse problems, and measure learning. Martin Burger obtained his uh, PhD in 2000 at Johannes Kepler University in Lenz with a supervision by Heinz Engel and Vincenzo Capasso as supervisors. After working as an assistant professor at the UCLA and in Linz, he moved to a position as full professor for applied mathematics in the Westfalische Wilhelms University Monster. I think it was uh, my German language, okay, for Martin at uh, 2006. Since uh, 2018, he is professor at Friedrich Alexander Universität Erlangen Nürburgring, and his research comprises inverse problem, nonlinear mathematical imaging, partial differential equations, and the development of uh, mathematical models in the life and social sciences which together drive interdisciplinary research developments, for instance, in biomedical imaging. Martin Burger received several awards and honors from, for his uh, scientific uh, contributions, such as the Calderon Prize for distinguished uh, contributions in the field of inverse problem, as well as a very prestigious ERC Conciliator Grant in 2013. He serves as a member of the editorial board of several mathematical journal, and he is one of the editors in chief of the European Journal of Applied Mathematics. I like very much to check uh, the life of people in Matesinet, and uh, at least on Friday, he is the co-author of 157 uh, papers with more than 2,600 uh, citations by 2,400 authors. His most uh, cited paper with uh, 289 citations is a joint paper with, with Stanley Osher, Donald Goldfarb, Jinshu Shu, and Wotao Jin concerning the iterative uh, regularization, regularization method for total variation based image restoration published in 2005 in multi-scale multi model simulation. In this paper, he presented, they presented a new iterative, iterative regulation uh, procedure for inverse problems based on the use of the a Bregman distance with an especial focus on problems arising in image processing. I think inverse problem is the focus of uh, his research from a long time ago. And today I like very much to hear not only this regularization method, but also the connections with machine learning. I hope you will enjoy with uh, the lecture by Martin Booker. Let's go, Martin. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation and the kind introduction to present my work here. Um, yeah, I hope I'm not too disappointing. I'm not sure how much of machine learning I can put also in these 40 minutes, so I will yeah, try to do my best. Um, let's go. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's something switched now in the Zoom. Okay, anyway. Um, so this is obviously a joint work with, with many people that I will put into here. I just, I cannot mention probably all of them, just to give you a slight impression. So there is a lot of my former students in the first lines and some, some of my longtime collaborators in, in the second lines, which all contributed to stuff that I will mention today. And there is one survey paper if you want to have something concrete. This is my paper with Martin Benning in, in Acton America two years ago. No, it's three years ago since <laughs> your F21. 
So let me start very basic to, to say what we are dealing with. Um, so basically we consider inverse and ill post problem. It's basically at a very abstract level is just an operator equation, linear or nonlinear between infinite dimensional Banach spaces. And under certain condition, for example, if K is a compact operator, this problem is ill posed. So there is the classical definition by Hadamard of a well posed problem. And you say if it's not well posed, it's ill posed. Um, and the potential issues are the basic issues you always encounter in, in equations is non existence and non uniqueness, um, which is sometimes yeah, enforced by, by certain approaches. But what is really creating a lot of headache in, in practical applications in particular is the instability. So if you invert K, then the inverse somehow is not, even if the inverse exists, it's not continuous. So you have a discontinuous dependence of the solution U on the right-hand side in the equation. This is something um, you have to deal with and you try to cope with in, in many of these inverse problems. So if you want to be more image-based, Thing. So what we have is basically we think of some infinite dimensional image, or so we could say some function, say in R2, in R3, or in, in some other domain. And then there's a forward operator K that maps to some data which are very indirect. So what I illustrate here is, is typical data in emission tomography or positron emission tomography. So basically this is a random sampling of the Radon transform of the image U in this case. So this is what creates the forward operator, and then you would have the, the inversion here. Actually, what I put here is already more than the forward operator because it's not the ideal forward operator from a mathematical point of view would be the Radon transform. But then there is also some thing that you consider as noise. So the fact that we don't have the perfect Radon transform, but some random sampling or some random perturbations that you cannot really control in, in practical measurements. So for example, in positron emission tomography, having less noise would mean putting more radioactivity to the patient. And as a patient, you don't want to have that. So certainly there is some balance between what the mathematician would like to have to get a perfect solution and what anybody else would have in order to have a decent life or to have no other issues. Okay, so image reconstruction or inverse problem is, is the solution of this inversion problem. Okay, let me go to some very basic um, yeah, theoretical things or some, some historical things also. Actually, one of the first to consider uh, in this province were the Russian school, in particular driven by Tikhonov. And Tikhonov was mainly a famous topologist. And his answer to, to recover well postness was simply to say, from a theoretical point of view, okay, restrict the domain of the operator to some compact set and then you get some kind of well postness of the problem. And then you also proposed what is called uh, yeah, sometimes Tikhonov regularization or Tikhonov Phillips regularization. So you approximate the least squares problem. So now we are in a Hilbert space setting to make it easier so that we really have a reasonable norm squared. Otherwise, okay, you would do it in a banner space with some appropriate exponent here. Um, this problem is as ill posed as the original operator equation. Okay, it's maybe not the issue with the existence so much of an exact solution, but basically all the instabilities is still there. The idea was to say, okay, you basically try to bound the norm in the original Hilbert space, it came and maps one to the other, or you can do this by some kind of penalty or um, Lagrange parameter. So what you end up with is some perturbed version of the least squares problem with some positive parameter alpha. And as long as alpha is positive, you can easily prove under reasonable condition on the operator k. Um, for example, in particular, if it's weakly continuous, then um, you can prove the existence of a minimizer by standard methods. For example, in calculus of variations, but you can also do it with spectral method because it's equivalent to some kind of equation. Okay, so this was the work by Tikhonov. There is some work uh, also by others in the US in, in the 60s and then in, in statistics, this is also called rich regression after a paper that well, was a bit later and typically also there is only finite dimensional and the issue is a bit difficult. 
So that was somehow the, the basic. And then in the 70s and 80s, there many people started to develop the some kind of analysis of what is called linear regularization method. So you apply really a linear method to a linear problem. So you operate the case linear and also your reconstruction problem is linear. Okay, it's not in the first view, for example, for Tikhonov that this is linear, but if you write this down as a as the optimality condition or the, the Gaussian normal equation, then you'll see this is a linear equation. So it's indeed a, a linear regularization method. Okay. And so the basic analysis considered what happens if, if I have noise on the data and the noise tends to zero and this parameter alpha tends to zero in, in the right way, not too fast, depending on how much noise you have, then you can prove somehow convergence to the optimal solution if, if the optimal solution of course exists, which is always assumed in this in this business. And then there was also some more quantitative approaches developed um, by several people I like to mention, in particular the work of Stuart Nashet and, and Chuck Roach in the 70s and 80s, and also the work of Frank Natura since he was my pre-successor in Münster. Um, and he also developed then his theory for inverse problems and also made it quite practical for one important problem in computerized tomography. So he developed this theory for the Radon inversion and involved with a very famous book in, in the 80s. Okay, and then there were some other methods that were looked at, for example, um, projection methods. So you regularize by going to a finite dimensional problem, which are maybe ill conditioned in the sense of numerical analysis, but never ill posed. Or iterative regularization, where you apply some nice iteration scheme, for example, some simple fixed point iteration and you stop it at the right point in order to get an approximate solution. So this is something that is nowadays very uh, fancy, and very fashionable in machine learning. So everybody's applying stochastic gradient descent or some kind of gradient descent to these problems. And then there's what they call implicit um, regularization effect. So if you stop at the right time, you get a better solution than if you go on forever. And basically in linear inverse problems, this was known at least in the 80s, in particular, by, again, by the, by the Russian school. And then there were some other methods based more on singular value decomposition. We are not going to detail it at this point. OK, and then um, towards the transition from the 80s to the 90s, there was more some other development of a complete theory for linear regularization. And there was one famous book by which I always have to mention because it's also my, my PhD advisor, Heinz Engel. So this book by Engel, Hanke Neubauer in the mid nineties gave a quite complete theory of linear regularization series. Of course, uh, summing up a lot that many people had done before. But maybe the, the more interesting thing even that happened in the, in the, in the late eighties, early nineties was the transition to go from linear to nonlinear inverse problems. And that required completely different mathematical methods. So basically the linear regularization theory can be done, and this is also done in this book, completely by spectral decompositions of the linear operator. So you do everything in spectral families and then you can put everything basically to one dimensional computations with respect to the eigenvalues or the elements of the spectrum. Whereas for nonlinear inverse problems, of course, there is no such chance and you have to really develop quite nonlinear things. Um, and then Tikhonov regularization was analyzed in this setting and also iterative regularization methods. For example, gradient-based methods for the least squares problem would be the easiest that were done in the 90s. And that changed a lot what were the techniques because uh, the analysis then started to use local linearizations of the operator, of course, but also in particular variational techniques. And this is something that, um, played a role then also for linear problems later and in particular at the transition to the 21st century I would say that the paradigms changed a bit um, so then people started also for linear problems to investigate non-linear regularization methods so you it's a bit philosophical it's a bit strange so you start to solve a linear equation by a non-linear method which if you tell someone in linear algebra you would shake heads or 
be irritated. But the issue is the following. The idea is you have typically some prior information. So what you think of, and this is also nowadays true in, in machine learning, you have some nonlinear kind of manifold of possible solutions that make sense. So for example, if you think about imaging, you have some nonlinear manifold of images that really should appear reasonably. And you want to enforce a solution of the linear problem or the same for nonlinear problem. But even in the linear case, you want to have something that is on or close to some nonlinear manifold in a sense. And that, may, that is the idea for introducing um, this kind of nonlinearity. And the other thing that were driving, was driving this um, was to get more ideas about not just the asymptotic behavior of the regularization method as alpha tends to zero, but to say, okay, in practice, you have to live with some kind of noise that with some positive regularization parameter, and you want to see what is the detailed structure. So I want to have very nice reconstructions also for positive alpha, not just in the limit alpha to zero. Okay, and then methods appeared like sparsity, parallel to compressed sensing, and a lot of Bayesian methods, and something that is now very fancy is, is the opposite, is to introduce machine learning techniques and to learn kind of regularization methods. That's something I would like to to mention also later. Okay, so let me just introduce what would you have, what, how would a variational regularization method look like? So typically it's always the same. You have some data term. So F I call the fidelity. So you could think if you don't want to think very general, you could still stay with the, with the least squares problem. So it's a squared norm of KU minus F. And then you, add some regularization functional. So in Tikhonov, this was Hilbert space norm squared. But the interesting thing is, stuff gets nicer when you have non-Hilbert space, space things here. Particularly, it turned out many non-reflexive Banach space norms or semi-norms are very uh, interesting here. We'll show you that on the next slide. OK, so just to mention, if J is convex, but not necessarily smooth you can formulate an optimality condition okay assume the first part is smooth and for the second i use a sub gradient of this regularization functional and take into account if you have a norm squared in a hilbert space then p would be equal to u so that would be a simple relation uh, and in general what you can see from this solving for p well it's, it's a complicated equation but what you see is this is what we call for a long time, the source condition, and with Martin Benning, we rather called it the range condition. So P is something complicated, but in any case, it's K star applied to some element, okay? And you can show that this condition is equivalent to having some F so that U is the minimizer of some regularization method. And obviously from this equation, you also see if U is the minimizer from the, of the regularization of this variational method, then P is K star of some W. Another interesting point appears here, it's this abstract smoothness that comes into K star. So you would think of K like the Radon transform or more general, some kind of integral operator. So typically K is a smoothing operator between Banach spaces. So then also its adjoint is a smoothing operator between its dual spaces. So this means this source condition is an abstract smoothness condition. Okay, in the simple case, again, where P is equal to U, it's a smoothness condition directly on the solution. In the more general case, it's a smoothness condition on the subgradient that determines everything. Okay, if you want to think more in statistical terms, you can also relate this to Bayesian estimation by Bayes theorem. So you would have the posterior is likelihood times prior divided by some prior of the data. And if you compute the maximum a posterior probability estimate, you have, okay, the negative log of the posterior. So basically, F is not dependent on, on U, so you can ignore that. So basically what you minimize is this term and you can compare this with the variational regularization method I wrote. So some other, then you see, okay, this fidelity is kind of the negative log likelihood of the data 
and the regularization is basically the negative log of the prior distribution, so at least from a formal point of view. Okay, so it's then clear somehow the data fidelity comes from a statistical model of the forward process. So for example, if you assume that you have an additive Gaussian noise, then this will have as a log likelihood a quadratic term with the covariance matrix. In the image that I showed you in positron emission tomography or in many other imaging forms, you have photon counts, which are Poisson distribution distributed. So you have Poisson noise, and then the uh, log likelihood is the kullback leibler divergence also well known from statistics or many other problems. Okay, so the, the fidelity is not the problem, but how would you choose the right regularization function? Um, so let's think about imaging first of all, where we want to have some, some smooth solutions or, or something like this. And of course, from a computational point and also historically from an analysis point of view, that's what you would do is okay, statistically choose a Gaussian prior or in other words, use the quadratic regularization functional in a Banach space. So for example, in images, when you say, okay, you don't want all these oscillations due to noise, you could say, okay, I take the simplest kind of norm that smooths. So I take this L2 norm of the gradient, so the semi-norm in, in the Sobolev space H1, and then I compute a reconstruction, okay? And then, for example, if you have a version of this with noise and you compute a reconstruction, you will get something like this in the left image, okay? And that is not optimal for particular imaging in particular for the human eye. If you go to your optometrist and shows you all these tests like this, and if you would see something like in the left image, then you would say, okay, maybe I would need some glasses. So this means this is not the right thing. And then for the human eye, the issue is that you have this smoothing phenomena on the edges. You don't have sharp edges. So if you ask 100 people, then at least 99 of them prefer the right image to the left one just because of the sharp edges that you see here. And this is something the human eye is trained to, to see and to recognize, them. okay? So what's happening? Well, the issue is again, the um, source condition again. So assume you have a forward operator on H1 or L2, and then write down the source condition so if this goes to some Banach space, the source condition was P, the subgradient is K star W. Formally, the subgradient is, is the negative Laplacian of U. So you see, you have here a lot of regularization, uh, a lot of smoothing effects from inverting the Laplacian and from K star. And even if K star is trivial and does not smooth, some elliptic regularity implies that U is in H2 under reasonable conditions. And of course, you know, in 2D, the Sobolev space H2 is embedded into continuous functions. So there is no discontinuity. This means there is no edges, okay? And you can make that um, more quantitative. So in a sense, we are reverting all the PD theory you're used to. We don't, so PD theory, you spend a lot of time to prove regularity of solutions. And here we say, we don't want the regularity. We want nice solutions, but not too regular ones. And that's a problem we, have to deal with, and this led to yeah, a lot of investigations. Um, so you could say, okay, you consider the P Laplacian energy instead of the two Laplacian, or say the LP norm of the gradient. And it turns out, again, as long as P is greater than one, you have similar smoothing properties, only in the limit P going to one, where you have to arrive at the total variation Okay, defined in a dual way like this, there you really have discontinuous or possibly discontinuous solutions. So what happens is the following, if you look at the subgradient of the total variation, you are now in, in, in the non-smooth setting. So there is not a one-to-one -one relation anymore between the solution and the subgradient. So what you have is again, the first term, but then in the subgradient, this is just a divergence of some vector field, and this satisfies some abstract conditions. But basically, what you can think of is this vector field G is a vector field of norm less or equal than one. 
and where the gradient of u is zero, it can basically be arbitrary up to this known constraint. But where the gradient is not zero, it points, it's a unit vector field pointing in the direction of the gradient. And also at the discontinuity set, it's a normal vector of the discontinuity. And then you can show, well, first of all, you can yeah, compute things. Um, we need to move at some point. Really see everything. Uh, urine is complicated. So here you see some test image. So this is the most trivial inverse problems you can think of. We take some only the embedding operator from two-dimensional BV to L2. We add some noise and then we do some denoising. And then you see total variation really recovers nicely the edges and piecewise constant solutions. And you see also another effect. Um, if you define total variation, you have some freedom here in what norm you choose. You could choose here for the vector field at each point the Euclidean norm or some little LP norm. So if you choose the Euclidean norm, uh, this is called isotropic total variation. And then you kind of have effects like in the usual isoperimetric problems. So nice curvature is. Yeah, done nicely here. So balls are reconstructed perfectly, but of course you cannot have infinite curvature here. And so these things are smooth, are smoothed here. So there are no sharp corners. So there's this little thing that you have to live with. If you take, well, for a dual would be the little L infinity norm. So basically you take also the little L1 norm of the gradient. Then you have what's called anisotropic total variation. And these two directions are preferred. So and you can have sharp corners, but you start somehow changing the ball. Here at these edges, um, it gets flatter than it should be, okay? And indeed you can interpret this the source condition as follows. The G is some normal vector field. So you have the divergence of a normal vector field and this is actually the mean curvature. So if you have a subgradient, at least in L2, okay, K was assumed to be the embedding operator, so K star will at least give you something in L2. This means you have basically a square integrable curvature. So this is why with the usual curvature in the isotropic total variation, you cannot have corners. And with this anisotropic curvature, you can have sharp corners, but you don't have really the nice properties of the ball. Okay, so now, to show you what happens on a real inverse problem. This is a simple problem in, in Petri construction. And here we had the freedom to play a bit with the noise. So this is what is done or was done in clinics for a long time in cardiac uh, positron emission tomography. So what you see here is the right and the left and here the right ventricle. And you have some tracer activity that in this case is radioactive glucose. Um, that goes into the, the heart and or the heart muscle to be precise. So if you measure for 20 minutes, that means the Poisson distribution is very nice. So it's almost exact data. So you have a very low noise level and you can do some simple reconstruction method. Uh, in this case, a simple fixed point iteration with early stopping and you can reconstruct solutions like this. If you have data only collected from five seconds, which would be very nice for the patient because, well, then he is not so long in the machine. And it's nice for the doctor as well because he can put more patients into the machines and make more money. Then with standard reconstructions, you end up with something very noisy where it's difficult to uh, see the details here. Whereas with total variation, you get some improvement already. So you start seeing more precisely the ventricle and the, the sharp edges that should be there. Of course, it's not yet perfect. And I will show you on some later slide how you can improve on that, okay? And typically what happens, and another issue is, it's not just total variation, it's not just putting the edges, it's actually, if you're honest, overemphasizing edges. So here you see, you start to have the staircasing phenomenon that on piecewise linear parts, you reconstruct stairs instead of the nice linear shape. 
Okay, and to cure this, there is nowadays a lot of improved versions that use total variation and somehow the second order total variation, so total variation of the gradient. I don't go into detail too much at this point. Okay. And a parallel paradigm that appeared in compressing was to use sparsity. So there is two formulations, you either in the analysis based or in the synthesis based. I think for simplicity, I stay with the synthesis based formulation. So you take some frame system, you try to develop U as a linear combination, but then you want to choose most of the coefficients as zero. And this is actually enforced by using again, the L1 norm of the coefficients. And you can think, of course, there's a lot of similarity with the non-smooth total variation also here. Okay, so if you redefine everything in terms of the coefficients and rewrite the operator in terms of the coefficients, you can write an analogous optimality condition. So then this is a, an operator say on little l2. And what you see here is the sub gradient of the l1 norm is always just the multi-valued sign of the coefficient. So this is again something that is plus one if it's positive, minus one if it's negative, or something in something in between if um, it's zero. And then you see, yeah, of course, in the infinite dimension setting, you see immediately that most entries of, of the coefficients need to be zero because k star will map to little l2. So in particular, this will give something that goes to zero with i. So this will be strictly less than one and more, larger than minus one after some index. And typically it's of course very unlikely to hit a lot of plus ones and minus ones here. So and this is why you see from this optimality condition again and the old source condition that most entries are actually zero. Okay, and there's a lot of generalizations that you can have. You can also make the L1 example continuous. So then you would take the total variation of a measure. This is something that is nowadays used a lot in super resolution microscopy, where you want to have really see more or less single points corresponding to proteins at high resolution. And then there's a lot of other um, methods that work basically on matrices or tensors, like group sparsities, where you would say you would have to, like to have one row zero or low rank or, or other uh, properties that maybe also don't go into detail today. Okay. Um, in the last, say, five years, a new idea became attractive, or actually really only in the last two or three years, is to use machine learning to say, um, okay, I would like to use some, I, some data from that I have to learn reconstruction methods. So the first idea would be to learn the whole reconstruction. This is called end-to-end -end reconstruction from data really to the unknown, so for example, to the image. But the problem is that there's a lot of problems. I mean, solving these inverse problems have a huge complexity in practice. So the networks are hardly handleable. Then there is another thing is the generalization properties. So you basically want to approximate then the ill post problem, which has by definition a Lipschitz constant infinity. So if you have a suitable approximation, you still have a huge Lipschitz, Lipschitz constant and all the generalization theory in machine learning tells you you need to have, for example, deep, net, deep networks with small Lipschitz constant in order to have suitable generalization properties. And then another thing in practice that is also difficult is you hardly have reasonable data. So you never have really pairs of the image and the output. So you don't have some of the patient and the, the image directly. So what you do there is you try to learn the regularization only and solve still the same problem and try to learn from some say favorable images and some unfavorable ones, some kind of, of regularization. So J should be, for example, or the par parameterized, for example, by some deep network so that you minimize this term. So this means it should be small on the favorable image. It should be large on the unfavorable images. And then you may have some kind of, of regularization again, so that J still has a, a suitable thing. Uh, structure itself or that the Lipschitz constant stays small, okay? What is interesting from the point of view of, of regularization methods is that now the regularization method is itself a random variable because it depends on the training data and you need to understand how it converges to some 
yeah, ideal problem where you take the full expectations on the data. Okay, and then there are some problems we recently work on yeah, introducing also the source conditions. Maybe I skipped that at this point. Okay, to show you a bit what are the mathematical issues, let me give you one example that I like from my work is, is quantitative estimates. So if you have ill posters, it's known that you can never have quantitative estimates except you have additional assumptions. This is called conditional stability. And it's very easy to illustrate. For example, if you have two elements satisfying a source condition, okay, with different source elements, then you can take this duality product between the subgradients and the primal variables introduce the source condition and the property of the adjoint operator and a simple estimate gives you that you have some, yeah, something depending on the source element times the residual. So this would be some of the quantity that you measure the output of the inverse problem. Okay, and for example, again, in the simple case where P is equal to U, then this would be the norm squared. And here you only have the norm, so you get a Hölder stability estimate only, and also this you only get under additional estimate. Okay, so in this case, what do we estimate actually? What we estimate here naturally is what is called the symmetric fragment distance, so the pairing of the dual and the primal variables. And this can be written as the sum of what's called the one-sided fragment distances. So, okay, some of the first order Taylor expansions, if J is a convex functional, and these are two positive things. There are distances in the sense that they are zero if u1 equals u2, but they are not, well, not symmetric. The symmetric one obviously is. And they also don't have something like a triangle inequality, but only some generalized, what's called Euclidean identity. So you have to be a bit more careful. Okay. And you can also obtain them differently from what we call scaled Jensen distances. So if you look at the type of convexity you have, you also get in the limit. In values s one and zero, you get these two one-sided fragment distances. Okay, but going back to the the error estimates, so once something I did with Stan Osher was to to look how we can generalize error estimates from linear techniques to these non-linear techniques. And so what you would like to have is you have on the one hand you had the solution of the variational problem with noisy data and positive regularization. And on the other end, some kind of exact solution of the problem with the non-noisy data, which satisfies some source condition. So what you can do is very similar to this conditional stability estimate, is you can estimate the symmetric fragment distance and the output norm uh, by these two things. So one is alpha times the norm of the source element squared. So if alpha goes to zero, this goes to zero. And this is basically the difference between noisy and exact data divided squared divided by alpha. And here you see that if the noise goes to zero, you have to be very careful. Alpha should not go to zero too fast. That's a standard thing also. Exactly the same in, in linear inverse problems. Okay, but with these techniques, we can get the same thing. Okay, and then you can get from the symmetric, of course, you get to estimate something which I call more the a posteriori estimate. So for the one-sided fragment distance where you use the subgradient that you got from the optimality condition. Okay, this is only one estimate. And then you can also have some, what I call a priori estimate for the other fragment distance. Okay, the right side is always the same because the symmetric fragment distance is an upper bound for both of them. And here you can use any subgradient if you have more than one. And this is interesting, of course, for all these non-smooth examples, you could use any subgradient to get an estimate. Okay, so you, this is in a sense a multi-valued estimate if the subdifferential is multi-valued. Okay. Um, another question is um, how can we make this a bit more precise? And of course, it's a very abstract estimate. We estimate the, the Bregman distance, which is a priori not clear what it is. And we use the source condition, which also many people claim it's too abstract. So if you want this make, to make this precise, you may need to characterize the source condition and you need to derive something more interpretable from the fragment distance. And I will show you this in one example now. And this is again, TV denoising, because this is where I can make it, I think, most apparent and it's, it's most simple. Um, so this would be a clean image that we don't know. This would be the noisy image of Delta, which you need to 
and you put into your method, then this is the total variation regularization result where you see you eliminate the noise, you get sharp edges, but of course you see in the grass, you also eliminate a bit the structure of the grass because it's also quite oscillatory. Okay, so how do we, can we estimate and understand subgradients? So for TV, we know again, as I said before, it's divergence of some vector field. And then for example, for the canonical images, which are piecewise constant with smooth discontinuity set, these are the ones that you can nicely approximate with the TBA methods, sometimes also called the cartoons. We can explicitly construct some nice subgradients. So basically, it looks maybe a bit complicated, so, but basically what we do here is we take the gradient of the distance function. So this is already a normal field, the distance function to the um, discontinuity set, the sine distance function, so signed by whether the jump goes up or down, okay? And then we put some function in front, also depending on the distance. So basically, which goes down in a, in a small distance epsilon. Okay, so g is such that it's one when it's zero. So at the end of at the discontinuity set, this is just the normal, and then it decays depending on the epsilon. It decays fast. Okay. So the source condition in this case means that we have a basically a divergence of g in L two, and you can compute this basically. And you get something which is you know, the de derivative of this G scaled with epsilon, and then you have the Laplacian of the sine distance function. And the nice thing is the Laplacian of this sine distance function is, at least on the interface, is just the mean curvature. Okay, and the whole thing is all only in an epsilon uh, surrounding of the discontinuity set. So only when the distance to the to the discontinuity set S is less than epsilon, you have to integrate because otherwise G and G prime become zero by my construction. Okay, and then you can compute the norm of the source element by basically the perimeter of the discontinuity set and some small parameter of epsilon small times the mean curvature integrated or squared mean curvature integrated on the discontinuity set. So in this sense, if you have reasonably smooth, so square integrable mean curvature. Discontinuity set, you have an ex a nice estimate on the um, source elements. And for each epsilon, you would get a different source element. So you could choose the right epsilon here to, to get. Okay, um, the another nice property here is, um, if you look at the one-sided fragment distance, we can use the property of one homogeneous functionals. So subgradient applied to U is always, is, this, is just the functional. At this element, so two terms in the fragment distance drop out. So the fragment distance is just, if we can use it again the same with the corresponding subgradient p hat, it's just this quantity. And from this, you can infer some locality of this fragment distance. So in particular, you can have, since p star is zero outside of an epsilon um, surrounding, so we could. For example, estimate the total variation outside this epsilon distance to the discontinuity set, set by the Bregman distance. And the Bregman distance we can estimate by basically the norm of the source element plus this term depending on the noise. So now we could say, how much variation can we have away from the real discontinuity set basically, or with distance epsilon, more than distance epsilon to the real uh, discontinuity set and then depending on alpha and the norm of the, well, basically depending on the size of the noise, you could optimize alpha and epsilon here to get the right estimate. So depending on how much noise you have, you get a very nice estimate um, that is small in terms, will be basically proportional to the norm of F minus F delta, not the norm squared and depend, the constants then depend on the perimeter and the squared mean curvature. Okay, so you get really from this thing, if you work a bit more, you can get quantitative estimates, okay? And there's a lot of work, well, I don't have time to mention that generalizes, of course, these things for different schemes, for stronger source condition, for weaker source condition, what's them called approximate source condition, for even unbounded noise and, and all kinds of, of things um, that can be done. And I just want to mention that for these abstract methods, 
you can get some indication of sharpness of the message by explicit examples, and those are constructed by what we call uh, yeah, nonlinear singular vectors. So basically, we try to generalize the singular value decomposition. This is a lot of work with Martin Benning. So at least if F depends only on the residual, you can do this quite closely as before. So you have two singular, the usual singular vector equation here, and here you have some generalization of the, the second singular vector equation. So in the simple linear case will be k star v is sigma times u. And then you introduce here the subgradient of j and also kind of the subgradient of the, of the fidelity to this definition. And then you can get explicit solutions, for example. Yeah, okay, in the squared norm case, you're back to the usual definition just to mention. And in more general ones, for example, you could characterize this to make sense. For example, in TV, in 1D, there was for, for many years some, some rationale or some folklore that har wavelets basically do the same. If you do the L1 norm of har wavelets, it's basically the same as TV regularization. And this could be made precise with Martin Benning that we showed that with this definition, har wavelets are exactly a singular vectors of the total variation with increasing singular values. So it's again, the scale, um, first how we let elements are a small singular vectors and the, the larger one, uh, yeah, can go on. Okay, and with this, you can, for example, use this to cure bias in inverse problems, you can, yeah, maybe I, I go over this and just mention this for the beginning, for the end, um, what you can do, instead of just solving one variational problem, is solve a sequence of variational problem, which is then called this, this Bregman iteration that was mentioned. And this is something that is nowadays also, yeah, so instead of minimizing here J, you somehow minimize the Bregman distance to the last iterate, anything else stays the same. And this is, yeah, just to come back also to machine learning, something that is very attractive also for the problem of learning sparse neural networks. So basically if you do this for the usual error measures, like the empirical uh, loss for neural networks and train a deep neural network, depending on certain tasks, you can even do the right regularization functional, this is something we did recently, you can even learn the optimal network architecture. So for example, here we got automatically without specifying it from this iterative regularization, a some kind of autoencoder structure after yeah, several iterations. And you can make a lot of variations here, for example, make it work like stochastic gradient descents and basically have the same complexity as, as stochastic gradient descents if you have what we call uh, stochastic and linearized versions of the of the Bregman distance. Okay, so see my time is over. So thanks a lot for the attention and I, I stop at this point. <laughs>